pace, 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 and then lead, lead, lead. Before you're able to tell a person what to do, you have to have a very good connection. Now, lots of people have the idea that if you have a good metaphor, a structured metaphor, then naturally it will work. And that is not necessarily true. It is more likely to work when you have a good interpersonal situation. Generally, when Erickson told a metaphor, it was not structured. But he didn't have to tell anything that was strictly structured to get the right effect. Actually, the less strictly structured it is, then the better it can be because it makes it harder for the person to follow consciously and it has the effect of confusing the person's conscious mind. So first, there must be a good connection between you and the client before using a therapeutic metaphor. Erickson. Well, there are lots of problems that people have. People come to me with all different problems. Some people are afraid of dogs. Some people are afraid of water. A woman came to me because almost all the time she was afraid to go out. And people can get relief in many different ways, relief from their problem. But let me tell you about a man who came to see me only the other day. When is pacing not appropriate? Or, same thing really. How do you get a very, very talkative person to sit, to shut up? Right, when you want to interrupt someone's processes, or when you want to stop a client talking who is talk, 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 talking his head off, and you try to break in but they're caught in a pattern and you can try your damnedest to interrupt them but they're totally on guard as it were and they'll outmaneuver out you don't nod, don't yes but don't do anything at all, sit and do nothing and just stare it will interrupt completely odd things. Make sure that there is unconscious participation from the listener, unconscious participation. If you sense there is conscious participation, then speed up a little bit to overwhelm the, un the conscious mind, overload the conscious mind with content. To shift a pain. It is possible by use of representational systems to disperse, get rid of pain. If the person is visually orientated, he can visualize the pain, totally describe the pain, and then visualize it being broken up. The pain has a shape. Get the shape from the person and get him to break it up. Always, always, always when working with pain, it's a good idea to actually find out exactly where the pain is. They'll say it in my chest, whereabouts in my chest, in your chest. Get it defined pre uh, precisely. How large is it? What's the color of it? Is it solid, hollow, or what? If a person is auditorily orientated, hear the pain fading away 
That's after hearing it, of course. The sound of the pain, what's it like? If kinesthetically orientated, feel the pain changing from whatever it was to something soft and silky before becoming watery and flowing away. Lots of other methods you can think of. Those are not the only ones. All right, smoking. One of the problems that you'll have coming to you on, well, very frequently, especially after there's been another scare about lung cancer or just after the price, is, the price of cigarettes going up again. Or maybe the DJ on the radio, is, on local radio, is having hypnotherapy to stop smoking. Lots of people phone you then. Now this can be a single session you can achieve quite a lot in one session with a lot of people, but it's inclined to be a very long one. Far better to have two or more. Usual start, of course. Body language, predicates, rapport. Now, motivation is very important. I always ask, why do you want to stop smoking? If a person says, well, they cost so much, I'm not interested. I tell them to come back in six months. Motivation is not important. If it's only cost, and if cigarettes were free, they'd just carry on smoking. Health should be the primary reason for stopping smoking. Remember that unconscious head movements provide, a diagno provide diagnostic information. Ask, you are here to stop smoking and watch the head movement, sometimes nods, sometimes shakes, in disagreement. Verbally you can get, yes I am, and the head shaking. Or it could be diagonal, twisting over diagonal. Be aware that the presenting problem may not be where therapy begins. There may be underlying problems which need attention. Now, why do people want to smoke? Or what do I want to stop? Health, social reasons, too dear. Some people, of course, keep on smoking because it's an unconscious pattern and they've got very little conscious realization of what they're doing. Others smoke to relieve stress. And remember that an approach for one may not be the best approach for another. Weakland talked of hooks inverted commas, hooks, H-O-O-K-S, values to which a client is attached. One person may value being unselfish, so you can aim therapy towards that. Encouraged, be encouraged to stop because of others, because of the family, especially for children. Why force your young children to smoke just because you smoke? They have to live in the smoky room, etc. Someone who is selfish, you can frame the therapy towards personal gain, not only as regards the money, but in health. Now, when asking for information, ask questions which are designed to get the information and at the same time lay the seeds of change, that it is going to happen, this is going to happen. Formulate questions to increase motivation and evoke, bring out, Resources that a client has, resources that can overcome problems. What brand of cigarettes have you been smoking? How long have you smoked? How much have you been smoking? How many cigarettes do you have at the moment? Why have you decided to stop smoking now? Have you ever stopped smoking before? Have you had therapy to stop smoking on other occasions?
have you is better than do you. If it's used repetitively, it multiplies the effect. And also, never forget that in these questions you can slip in embedded commands. Why have you decided to stop smoking now? Have you had any habits that you've overcome and how have you done that? Try to get the strategy that was used on that occasion. Doesn't matter what the habit was that was stopped. Try to get the strategy used. It can be applied to the smoking problem. What have you enjoyed about smoking? Find out what was so pleasurable about the habit and devise a hypnotic strategy to provide the same sensation. Smoking for relaxation, teach self-hypnosis. What have you enjoyed about the mechanical act of smoking? Have you enjoyed drawing on the cigar, a uh, cigarette? Have you enjoyed the feeling of the smoke hitting the back of the throat? Have you enjoyed the feeling of it filling your lungs? Have you enjoyed seeing the smoke curling up into the air? Lots more like that. Project a sort of warmth and curiosity, really. I suppose, in a way, one could, you're looking at some odd character. Be curious. Create a negative connotation. And use the patient's consciousness to help fight an unconscious habit. With this type of question, with this sort of question, then you can make him painfully aware of what he's been doing. It helps to promote change. Instead of you using aversive therapy, you know, aversion therapy, assist the client to be averse to smoking. Much more powerful. Now, in working with all kinds of habits, promote pattern disruption. Find out as much as you can about the habit. Usually it's self-perpetuating. The pattern creates more of the same behavior. Find the weak link in the pattern and use hypnotic techniques to disrupt at this point. Often the urge to smoke is the first point that he is aware of in the pattern question carefully to try to discover the unfa uh, unconscious factors that come first. Will you describe the urge to smoke in detail? Usually it's a problem for the client to, to describe this urge to smoke unless it results from a sudden moment of stress. So, explain that all feelings are bodily sensations and talk about a particular feeling. If you know of any negative feelings a client has, talk about them. If he's depressed, describe depression. You know what the feeling of depression is like. Your shoulders feel heavy, your body is heavy, you may have a tight feeling in your chest or a heavy feeling in your stomach, etc. Then I ask the client to describe the urge to smoke. Well, it's like a pressure. Get a specific response. Is it a burning feeling, a tingling feeling? What's it been like? Rarely can he give an accurate physical description. But it makes him consciously think about the urge to smoke and it helps towards pattern disruption. 
He is encouraged to become very self-conscious, and this conscious strategy is used to disrupt an unconscious pattern. For more indirect disruption, ask him to compare the urge to smoke to another negative feeling, anger, fear. Again, this attaches more negative affect to smoking. Explain that there is some sort of sensation that triggers off the smoking. Just before you reach for a cigarette, what happens? Press him, really press him. Find out the minute detail of his pattern. The more you find out, the easier it is to create possibilities for change. Explain there are two opposing parts that need to be recognized. One part is definite about stopping. Another part has been holding back. A part has been enjoy, has really enjoyed smoking and another part has disliked it. So it's the one part is definite about stopping. Of course it's disliked it. And the other part has been holding back because it's enjoyed it. Now quantify the parts. If you had a hundred point scale, scale to a hundred, how much would you allot to the first part and how much to the second? You never get 50-50. 80-20 to the wanting to stop, the disliking. 75-25, 70-30, they're common. Use this to assess motivation. If you get a 90-10, then really that person should stop smoking very, very easily. Never forget that whatever you find out, this type of dissociation can be useful at a later date. Ask the question, how long will it have to be before you realize you are permanently free? How long will you have to have stopped smoking, in other words, before you realize that you're free from the smoking habit? Get him to commit himself to a period of time, common two to three weeks. Then, will you describe in detail all the reasons that you can think of for not taking a first puff after you stop smoking? Be meticulous about this. Get detailed lists. Once he verbalizes reasons, it becomes much more difficult to use that reason to rationalize smoking, I guess. How will you tell people you have stopped smoking? This, of course, is presupposing change and orients him, orientates him towards a, a positive future. People, unfortunately, often look upon stopping smoking as a sort of life and death struggle. But the idea of stopping can be so reframed that more positive feeling can be attached to the process. During an induction, listen carefully to this, there is no need to do anything, no desire to do anything. You can just be comfortable because there is no reason to have any other experience but to attempt to pay attention to developing comfort. I isolated, there is no need, no desire, be comfortable, no reason. And that's to have a smoke again. can be interpreted on at least two levels. He's being instructed about hypnosis, but at the same time is there to stop smoking. No need, no desire, no reason can apply to the state of hypnosis or the urge to smoke. Now the interesting thing about smoking is that people will come to you and they'll say, I haven't got any willpower. I'm all right on everything. They want you to tell them to stop, to help their willpower. Obviously, there can be a few, quite a few problems, common ones in stopping smoking, lots of tension, feeling irritable, short-tempered. 
interesting thing is that a person, if a person thinks he won't have any withdrawal symptoms, he doesn't have them. But a lot of people have been conditioned to think that there are terrible withdrawal symptoms, and they get them. You also got to be concerned about transferring the habit to another habit, especially eating. And that's a fear on, uh, in the mind of a lot of people, especially if they're all already a little bit plump. They don't want to suddenly start eating a lot more food because they've already got a weight problem. Now, there are people who expect to be ordered to stop smoking. They expect to be hypnotized into doing what they feel they cannot do themselves. Do a lengthy preparatory talk. Explain what hypnosis is and what it isn't. Talk about the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Stress the fact that consciousness, consciously they don't have to listen at all. Change comes from within, via the unconscious, much better than from the conscious mind. For the induction, obviously you've got to check the VAK, Visual Auditory Kinesthetic. Good idea, of course, is to find out about a recent holiday, if it was a good holiday. Talk so that, so that it goes inside. And then talk about being a permanent and lasting non-smoker. Nothing bothers you the same, etc. Use ego strengthening, confidence building. Don't be surprised if he comes back in a week saying, I'm still smoking, I'm afraid. A lot of people do that, or some people do that. Oh, how many are you smoking? Oh, I had five yesterday. Didn't smoke before? No, 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 I didn't smoke before that. I had five yesterday, and I've already had one today. Now, this could be a man who was on 40, 50, 60 a day, or even more. And yet he thinks that simply because he's had a few cigarettes, he's back onto the habit again. Okay. Well, I couldn't tell you that this was likely to happen. After all, you've had a habit for a long time. But now that you've cut right down, it's simple enough to stop. Let's cut it out altogether. The second session next week, on oh, that week, talk about having had good success in the last week and it'll be easy to achieve what you want. If there's no change after the first session, then for God's sake don't do exactly the same. Try something else and there's a lot you can do. Now smoking is a, is a problem, a habit problem that's got lots of secondary gains. In other words, smoking gives certain things to a smoker. Certain things that serve a positive purpose. It's pleasanter, better to smoke. Pleasanter, better to smoke. And therefore, good to have access to those two things rather than giving up smoking. A person comes and says, I want to stop smoking because it's damaging my health. But if that person stopped smoking without anything else happening, he would no longer be able to access those certain things that serve as a positive purpose or the pleasant things he gets from smoking. Now, if you get him to stop smoking, it's very, very possible he would start smoking again in a matter of weeks or months because he would lose far too much by not smoking. So, although I'll give you some methods that can be used to help people stop smoking, you'll have people starting to smoke again after a little while, unless you give them something in its place. Now, one of the things, a popular thing, this is con contractual management. A smoker contracts not to smoke except in a very specific situation. Or he smokes in a specific situation. Work it out yourself. In class you don't smoke because you know I don't encourage it. Fine. 
on the underground sit-in non-smoking compartment. Go, if you go to the cinemas, I believe some cinemas now, sit uh, smokers in a very special part of the um, building. Don't sit in that, sit somewhere else. And what you do is gradually, gradu the, the client contract not to smoke in specific situations. You gradually extend the contract. In other words, more and more places he doesn't smoke in. Now, there must be explicit instructions so that smoking is not paired with anything else. When he smokes, that's all he does. No talking, no eating, no reading, no TV watching. The more the pairing occurs, the more these activities will bring on the smoking behavior. If he always smokes when watching TV, then watching TV will make him want to smoke. Get him to phase out smoking in car, or bus, or any transport. Get him to cut down to only certain hours during the day. And an ideal thing is to smoke in one chair in one room in his own house and do nothing else while he's smoking. And it would be good to have that chair, if it's a full house, up in the attic. And in the winter it's easier to smoke, easier to stop smoking that way. If you have to go climb up into what could be an unheated attic to sit there doing nothing else but smoking. If he reinforces himself every time he re resists a cigarette by saying, well done, that was good, I feel great, has a mental image or some pleasant experience, then he is strengthening himself. In this way, remember, there can be an anchor brought in, a really positive anchor brought in. When he resists a cigarette, then the anchor is activated, a positive one. It's imperative he shouldn't get on to himself, berate himself for smoking an extra cigarette, or for not resisting. He'll get depressed and anxious, and then smoke more. It's too, too common for C for someone to slip up once and then say, to hell with it, I can't do it, and then smoke like mad. Another method, of course, is to cut down slowly, setting a target time. So many weeks ahead, cutting down, and that's not a very good method, except for a few. So I'll give you a few methods, a few methods of stopping smoking. I talked about the direct method contractual, etc., but replacing habit with a healthier one. Deep breathing, chewing a few nuts. A lot of people do chew gum, not sweets, not good. Anchor time when never smoked, triggered off by feeling of wanting to smoke. And as soon as an urge comes to want to smoke, the anchor of self-control can be established. A simple one, which sometimes works, I often throw it in as sort of extra weight, hypnotic suggestion that the unconscious will solve the problem. You can drill a client into a new strategy. One would be kinesthetic internal, that's having the feeling of wanting to smoke. And auditory internal, get him to say, I'm getting, I am getting healthy through not smoking. Then to a visual construction, seeing, smiling, refusing cigarettes. And then to kinesthetic internal again, feeling good, combined with a very positive anchor from a time in the life when he did really feel good. 
through hypnosis build in by reminding of past resources strong feeling of hell one I, I use almost all the time as part of the of any other treatment is use of metaphor how one changes habits of childhood change before we went to school we had habits that we stopped by going to school we start doing things without careful thinking etc I talk about updating our experience of not being slaves to things from the past we have the choice the chance of just updating ourselves anchor a very strong resource to sight of cigarettes you can use aversion therapy of course but it and it does work with a few people Of course, the thing is with a lot of people is that they say it is a total habit. They will light a cigarette and put it down in the ashtray only to find another one there that's only just recently been lit. They don't know they're doing it until the cigarette is lit. Break the habit. Just break it. Make the person intensely aware of every step that's involved in smoking. Rather than aversion therapy, far better to make even the thought of smoking unpleasant. Through the IMR, idiomotor response, finger raising, contact the unconscious and ask if it knows what feeling accompanies physical addiction. Then ask the unconscious to work out a way of linking that feeling with something else such as pleasure, curiosity, happiness, laughter, each time feeling occurs. A person can end up doing something other than smoking. Anyhow, in all cases, insist really that they put money to one side each day. The beauty of that is that they then see some sort of benefit 